welcome to tonight's show. Thank you so much for joining me and we're in for a treat tonight because we're going to the theatre as I will be speaking to writer, director and theatre producer John Conway about his latest production Peter Pan starring the sensational boy George as the infamous Captain Hook and actor Jordan Conway as the legendary Peter Pan. It's on for three nights at the Eventim Apollo in Hammersmith, London and by the reviews so far it's going to be a hit. Let's welcome them to the show. Welcome both of you, Jordan and John. Thank hi, you so yeah, much. Hi. Father and son. <laughs> Looking very nice. You're, you're sort of blending in with my sofa today. Yeah, there was a bit of leftover. Yeah. Off, but I thought I'd use it. <laughs> Lovely to see you both. So this is incredible. I mean, you're known as the world's most experienced pantomime producer. I wrote my first pantomime yeah. when I was 20. So it's 45 years, can yeah. you believe it? Do you think back and think, oh my gosh, how, how did those years just pass so quickly? Uh, no, I think every single one is etched on yeah. my face somewhere. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I wrote one then when I, when yeah. I was in it, and I started producing as young as 24 years old, the same age as Jordan is now. Wow. And um, we, we formed a company which was called Kudos, and it became the biggest pantomime producer in the world. And then I wrote one in Mandarin, can you believe? And we did it in, in China, we've done it in America, I've done it in Africa. And what was that one called? What, what uh, we did Aladdin. Aladdin. Would you believe, would you believe wow. we did Aladdin <laughs> in China? It's like taking coals to Newcastle. And we did Peter Pan in America yeah. and uh, Jack and the Beanstalk in uh, South Africa. And so I stopped doing theatre shows about six, seven years ago mm -hmm. and concentrated on arenas because I wanted to do something different. And yeah. So we produced... Uh, what the Guinness Book of Records has agreed with us is the world's biggest pantomime because we do it in the biggest space, 7,000 seat arena. Oh my goodness. We have three stages in the arena. In this show, when Boy George makes his entrance, he sails on a life size galleon Love across it. loads of waterfalls all the way around the arena. We have aerialists from Cirque in, in the sky. It's so huge. the Peter Pan is the one that's going to be in, fingers crossed, the Guinness World Book of Records. Is well, it? We, we think so. And of yeah. course, uh, we needed a special Peter Pan. Oh, well, it had to be. Jordan, Peter Pan, playing the legendary Peter Pan. What's that been like? Because, I mean, you you've, you were in the film. Um, the film that I looked at and I saw was Faded Glory in 2020. Um, you're in that, of course, aren't you? But you do lots of things. You're also a comedian. Yeah. Um, you know, you work with your dad, obviously. What was it like? First of all, what was it like growing up with a father like John? Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's great. It has its perks. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's, he's been really good. It's, it's been great working on everything together. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we did the films together as well. And it's a really interesting dynamic working with your dad. So obviously you can disagree on things, but we get there in the end. Yes. Peter Pan, tell us about it. So you know Houdini? Yes. And he did, his famous thing was the uh, escapologist. Yes, underwater. yes, underwater. So we're doing that uh, in the show and I have no experience with it whatsoever. I thought it would be a good idea. Um, and the first time I got in the tank was on the promo the other week. And the cameraman was saying, right, bang on the thing, pretend like you're drowning. So I was shouting, help me. And what I didn't realise was, is that I was actually drowning. Because <laughs> oh, I was no. like, help me, help. <laughs> and they, the camera... Sorry, why are we laughing? We're yeah. all laughing. <laughs> Everyone was, and they're going, yeah, yeah. that's great, Jordan. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, that is on the promo video. I've it seen is, it, which yeah. we're going to be showing our audience. So, you know, just a little clip. But it, Peter Pan is, of course, is a legendary um, part to play. And what's it like being uh, opposite the Captain Hook of a uh, boy George? Very interesting. He's yeah. um he's a really really nice guy. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity for me as well to showcase what I can do. And obviously Dorit Kemsley's in it. As yeah, well. now Dorit Kemsley, but she's huge, isn't she, in America? So who else is the cast? Tell us about the cast. Sixty people are in yeah. the cast. It's got Cirque performers in it, dancers, break dancers, oh, singers. Yeah. It's kind of got a bit of everything in it, which is what's so good about making it uh, more modern because we've kind of scrapped all the old traditional values whilst keeping the basic fundamentals yeah. of it in. And was that your intention, John? Did you yeah, want to make it like that? The first thing is that you can see a pantomime everywhere. You can. You know, at school, your village hall, a local theatre. We want to make this an event. And um, we've had a lot of interest in taking it to America for next year, because obviously George is very well known there of and doing a huge stuff. Mm. It's an event. It's not like any pantomime you've seen. Like Jordan said, there's still ease behind you, and oh yes, you did, I oh, know you didn't. But the way we stage it is, is very different. The hardest thing working with Boy George is going to be that everybody said to me, ooh, Boy George, oh, he'll be, oh, is, ooh, is he difficult? <laughs> What's he like? And I know it's a cliche, he's the nicest guy in the world. He's a really nice guy. Too nice. So we were saying to him, no, no, you have to be Yeah, because he's Captain Hook, he's yeah, going to yeah, be yeah, evil. Come be on, evil. yes, that's well, it. Said, well, I, don't, I don't like to be too... No, no, you've got to be horrible. <laughs> oh, all right, then, he said. 
and bend for it. I know it's not just at the Hammersmith, is it? It's it's not just the Hammersmith, no, we, it's around the country. We, we tour everywhere. It opens in Blackpool at the world famous uh, Winter Gardens, which is the biggest theatre outside of uh, England. Three and a half thousand seats outside of London. Uh, and then it goes to Aberdeen, Glasgow, Cardiff, Cardiff Nottingham, Birmingham. Oh, so all over the country. And when does it open? When October 26. Fantastic. So yeah. you've so got it's almost more of a musical yes, than just a yeah. pantomime. What was it like for you, Jordan, playing, you know, because it's so different. It's not just as you say a traditional pantomime. Was it was that was it great playing it's, that? It's fun. Yeah. Because um also for the first time we're trying to make Pan the comic, so the comedian in it. Yeah. So uh it goes away from the the traditional, yes, yeah, <laughs> which is nice because I'm, I'm, yeah, that's what my background's in. Mm. So it's playing to my strength. So it's it's going to be easier than and, and traditionally, Peter Pan is played by a girl. Yes, yeah. yes, I, I mean, yes, weird. it is. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm growing my hair out. Yes, so, yeah. <laughs> but in the cross gender world, yes. it's a boy originally played by a girl that's now being played by a boy. It's, that's right. And you, you know, I've seen the promo and you play it very well. What was your favourite part? Coming out of the tank alive. Yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> No, the best bit actually was when we went to Hollywood. No, you should be saying, seeing my son come out of the tank alive. <laughs> yeah. I thought he was acting well. Well, of course, yes. The, the, the most fun so far is going to Hollywood meeting Dorit, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, they'll tell us a little bit about Dorit for those who don't know her. What's she doing? The show's called Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and it was the first and original of the Real Housewives franchise. And she's been in it for six years. The show's been running 13. And we were astonished because we kind of knew it a bit here. Yes. And the link is that she's boy George's best friend. And George right. is a uh, godfather to her children. And so she wants to break into acting. She's a great TV performer. She's famous as Kim Kardashian, isn't she? Yes. Yeah, big. she is. She's, she's quite you know, big in America. They don't ma maybe know her so much over here unless you're an avid, you're um, a big, fan, you know, yeah. big fan of the show. Of but course. we were staying at this hotel. Uh, quick plug, the Hotel Ziggy on Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> Everybody was there, weren't they? Yeah. Uh, Pink Floyd, Lisa Kudrow. Just like they were sat next to us on the table. Oh, great! Oh, looking around, go, we might play. Yes, that's right. <laughs> What's the basketball player? Luka Doncic. She's very famous and oh, around. Wow. There were so many famous people there. He was the only one he'd never heard of. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, we we get, went up to yeah. her place, and they do film it as live. You've been in it as well, Jordan, yeah, haven't you? Did you make a sort of cameo appearance? I did. I was wearing a bright blue and white suit, so I was standing <laughs> out. But the irony is, it was absolutely chucking it down, raining. Oh no! So, in they, LA, they, I can't yeah. believe it. But they do it as real, so we yeah. arrive 20 minutes early, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 go away, go away. Yeah. We all have to, we have to film and drive. What? That's TV, isn't it? Yeah. But it's not. The whole thing is it's actually, kind of, we didn't meet yeah. Dorit until we met her on camera. So what made her decide to come and, and work with you, John? One of the great thrills of my career is, is developing new talent. So Bradley Walsh, Shane Ritchie, Brian Connolly, Bobby Davro, the Chuckle Brothers even. Mm -hmm. I wrote and developed all their first television and I managed some of them, they worked with me. And um, I got to a stage later in life where suddenly he's of an age and says, I'm not sure I just want to be an actor, I'd like yeah. to be a comedian. So we, we wrote an act for him. But so, so I'm quite well known yes. for developing talent and also for bringing people in who'd never done it before. Um, so lots of it, famously, Leslie Grantham, Dirty Den was our first. I didn't know that. Book. Yeah, he did eight years. And lots of, um, oh, we had Jeff Capes, you know, the Olympian, the strongest Olympian, man on the world. Yes. <laughs> uh, we've had swimmers and we brought all the Australians over originally in the 90s. So I'm quite well known for bringing in people and helping them if they've never done it before. Yes. And so that was a natural call for Dorit to say, uh, I'd, I'd love to do the show. And she's gorgeous, isn't she? And you clearly enjoy it. You know, you clearly enjoy I mean, doing that, helping others. And yeah, exactly. And was it great for you to work with her? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we haven't um, yeah. started anything as of yet. No. But she, she, again, she, it sounds like a cliche, but she is really nice. Yeah. The kid, is that the cutest kid? Yeah, the kid's amazing. How, she's like six or something. <laughs> Jagger and Phoenix. Has a better vocal oh, than it. I do. Like yeah. She speaks so well, it's crazy. <laughs> it's exciting, though, because, you know, you're, it's not out yet, so it's great that you can come along and talk about it with us tonight but is it is there anything that's that has that's gone wrong or has happened that you weren't expecting john the thing about it is that it, it's an event so yes. look i've done lots of pantomimes and I, and I love the genre but some of them are a little bit conveyor belt same yes. now and oh it's the same show they've done and they just move it town to town we create something brand new and we only do three or four performances in each city to seven thousand people so, firstly, the atmosphere is electric. It's cross between pop concert and theatre. Um, and you never know what's going to happen with that many people when it's not that rehearsed. Yeah. So there's always this edge that it's something exciting. I mean, one of the interesting things is a few years ago, we worked with Paul O'Grady. And we, we loved Paul, didn't we? Yes, he was So John was my secret weapon. Because Paul, although he's great, 
I mean, has a reputation for a temper like you can't believe. And doing it in an arena, which, and we were flying him in, and there was horses and oh ponies. Also, and it was mayhem. And when Paul went, what the heck? What's going on now? <laughs> so I used to send Jordan, tell Monica what you did. So we had a shirt and pony in oh. the show. And obviously he loves animals, yes. doesn't he? So whenever Huge. he had a meltdown, I'd just go and get the Shetland pony and bring it over oh, to him. Oh, that's stroke the so pony. lovely. Well, the pony's oh. not well, Paul. He's got colic. Oh, bring it in. Oh, classic. Right, we're going to take a quick break. So stay with us and come back and join us in just a minute. Welcome back to the show. Before the break, we were just talking about the lovely Paul O'Grady. And lovely, I love the way you brought the Shetland pony in. He must have loved that. He did. He loved every animal. Yeah. And the great thing for Jordan, because Bradley Walsh was in the show as well, oh. and uh, Dick and Don. Um, I should tell Mike about... Cause oh, tell a, us a story. As a kid, you know, it, I looked after and managed all sorts of people, the Osmonds and David Essex and all sorts. Henry Winkler, I wrote Happy Days with him. So he's met people since he was little. And I've only ever seen him phase meeting one, actually two celebrities. Who were they, Jordan? Dick and Dom. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they were my heroes growing up. Yes. They were, I love the anarchy yeah. that they did. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've met a lot of people. Yeah. And, you know, it's casual. Yeah. With these people, I was like a little girl. Aww. I love them. Nice. But the great thing is, though, when he had... Because uh, what were you, 16, 17 then? Mm -hmm. Having O'Grady and Bradley to learn from. Yeah. Oh, you know, amazing, amazing. Three, amazing. three years with Bradley. In the end. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, you've worked with so many people, John, but you know, let's talk about Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin, The Feud, it's called. So tell us about that, Jordan. You're in that. Yeah. What, are you, what part are you playing in I'm that? playing Chaplin. Wonderful. It'll be great. So we open on the West End, July 24th. Uh, and the story is the untold but true story about how Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel were roommates and Stan was his understudy and then Chaplin got a break in America, promised uh, he'd bring Laurel out, didn't and then they never spoke again. And that's a true story, isn't yeah. it? But they spent yeah. three years working mm. and touring together, so they were really close. And uh, Jordan bears an astonishing resemblance to young Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Because the story I takes place yeah. when they're both in their early 20s. Yeah. Um, and the other guy, Matt Knight, who's playing uh, uh, Stan, you've worked with him a lot, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. And is that touring as well? Is that going to be touring? We're going to go to Blackpool at the yeah. end of the summer. Oh, that's right. And yes. then we'll see how it does in London um, to, you know, to see what we do with it uh, next. Do you find that, John, when you're putting on um, certain plays or pantomimes, that some plays work really well in, in some parts of the, of the UK and others, that it just, for whatever you, reason, I, it just doesn't suit? I think it's more about genre than geography now. Mm. Oh, that was, that's pretty good. <laughs> Did you tell him to say that, Jordan? <laughs> they used to say that if you tell a joke in London, you won't get a laugh in Scotland. Do you yes. know why that was? They couldn't hear you. But now it's more about where you, the type of people you play to than where you play. And what we're trying to do with this, which is quite unusual, isn't it, is to bridge the generation gap. We did Chaplin last year at the Edinburgh Festival yes. at the Fringe. That was what they call a tryout. Yeah. And did it go well? It did. But the hard thing was that they put four or five shows in the same venue on the same day. Yeah, and the show before us was a bubble show. I kid you not. Right? So, like, midway through the tap dancing routine, there was bubbles coming up from yeah. our feet. It looked like we were working really hard. <laughs> um, it was like Chaplin of Ice because the soup, yeah. all of them hadn't quite oh, cleaned no. it up. P particularly, and I believe in family entertainment. Yeah. And the f so you can bring your family to see this, and in London the prices are reasonable. Yes. Because, I mean... I'm not joking, it's a thousand quid to take four people to see some Western. Yeah, I know, it's it's so expensive. This, we do a family ticket at a hundred. I think that's really important because, you know, the theatre has to be opened up to, to the younger generation. And do, are you finding that, Jordan? Do you do you find that, you know, people of your age and, and younger are, are wanted to come to the theatre or is it still seen as a sort of a... Not unless you know, there's an incentive. Yes. But that's the whole reason of why we've tried to make mm. the show affordable, is so that families can come. And it is aimed for fa at families anyway. And it's fun. Charlie Chaplin's story is a, is a classic example, but I want to speak to you about um, Grimaldi because um, he was a very, very famous clown in the 17th century. And so... Putting on my historian. Yes, that's right. Now, tell us about that. Well, Joe Grimaldi was around at the reign of uh, King George, the same time as the Napoleonic Wars. 
and uh, Beau Brummel, all that Georgian architecture yeah. we see. And the style of pantomime that he invented, really, 230 years later, people are still doing. But he was way ahead of his game, though, wasn't he? Oh, he, was, yeah. he was so... Entre he would be on he would have been called entrepreneurial, in, but obviously that word didn't exist. He then. would do two or three pantomimes yeah. or shows yeah. in, in different venues. It's crazy. I've read his story, and it's a fascinating story. He invented the white face. With the, that was kind of, and the idea was instead of wearing a mask with the big red mouth on it, you could see it better at the back of the stalls. And they did the first transformation scenes. They they put water on the stage; it never been done before. And we're sort of copying that with our spectacular show now. But the interesting thing was, that as he got older, his son took over. But they didn't they didn't know it wasn't <laughs> him because of the makeup. Yeah, ah, you see. And he wasn't too didn't have a great end, his son. Did no, no, he um. What happened? He he used to drink a lot. So he was out one night and he got hit over the head and he developed epilepsy. Oh no! But because the medicine was nothing like it yes. is today, they just thought he was mad. So they used to put him in a straitjacket and only let him out for the shows. You the can't wonderful... even begin to imagine what that must have been like. Can but you the wonderful really? thing That's... is that um, the Chuckle Brothers, yeah. the Americans may not know that, but yeah. everybody in England knows the Chuckle Brothers. We know the Chuckle Brothers. Well, I've written and worked with them forever since, mm. since before they were famous yes. and Jordan had known them since being a kid and it was Barry's last ever film performance before he sadly passed and Jordan uh, played his son in it the mad Grimaldi mm. it was it a, a, a sort of a an experience just to play that that character yeah it was also the first thing I ever did on camera so I mean I learned so much for him because I mean he did hundreds and hundreds of tv episodes and just the way how he moves and holds yeah. himself is it he, I, I miss him a lot. He's far too modest to tell you, but on his first film, he got the uh, Los Angeles Independent Film Festival, Festigious, Turin, and when was the other one? Saint-Tropez uh, Film Festival as uh, a Best Sporting Act. And he won an award. That's excellent. Well done. And I mean, what do you see for the future of theatre, John? Do you think it's going to change? I mean, and for you, Jordan, who's, you know, you're young, you're coming into the theatre, you're seeing how your dad does things slightly differently, mm. which is great, isn't it? But for you, John, as a theatre producer, do you see it going in, a, in another direction? Do you think it's going to be the classic, what we, what we tend to saw, or we go into the theatre? Or do you think it's going to become more like an event now? I think the issue is that Top line theatre is so expensive to do now. It's becoming price prohibitive. And secondly, therefore, because people don't want to take a risk, you get revival after revival, or it's a film that they then put on stage. I mean, in fairness, we do that with Elf. Uh, but um, that's the problem. There's not enough new things coming out because people don't want to take a risk, and it's very expensive. But comedy sells, and that's why um, you couldn't get better than Stan Laurel and Charlie Chaplin. Yeah to do a show about. And you know, people are always inventive, but it's the economics of it now, which are very risky. Uh, and so I think when you do something, it has to feel like an event. Yeah. What would you like to do in the future? Obviously, Peter Pan is your, is your biggest, and that's coming out in 2024. Um, is it 2024, 2026? Uh, 23. 23, 23 yeah. okay. Well, we've got plans for a movie, which right, we've okay. been developing for a little while, Ooh. called Levitate. Tell us about that. Well, it's all about a boy who can fly, but not like Peter Pan. Uh, but he has a supernatural ability, and it's a, a very moving film that um, uh, I think will inspire people because um, he only develops this ability when he's under pressure or stress. It's like a superpower, something and people that people start believing he's the second coming. I was looking for a good-looking young guy who do as he's told and work cheap. <laughs> Where's that person? Oh, there we are, Jordan. <laughs> but it, it's interesting because he has a yeah. totally different creative yeah. uh, flair. Jordan's much better technically than I am with film. Um, I tend to do a bit more of the scripting. You've got a great eye. Who's that, for, who's that director you like that I can't pronounce his name? A lot. Uh, a, yeah, I was going to say, do you like doing film, Jordan? Is that That's something you passion, like? Yeah. yeah. I want to be a director when I'm older. Yes. But yeah. I know that you have to get, have a lot of experience to do that. I think the experience helps because it allows you to then say, I've been there. Yeah. I've been there. I know the struggles. I know what this person's going through and, and, and the rest of the crew. So I think it just helps, doesn't it, having that experience. But would you see yourself like in a Hollywood film, perhaps? Obviously. That's the goal, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But Come on, Dad. Steps. Get that sorted. Well, the great thing <laughs> Chaplin, it, this Laurel and Chaplin, the feud that we're doing, is that when we were in America a couple of months ago, we went to the William Morris Agency, which the, oh, lovely, yes. the lovely Megan has just been represented by them. And she was in just a few days after us, same agent. And this agent looks after Baz Luhrmann. 
Right. Others. And John was a bit overwhelmed. And he went, no, I think this is great. I want to come and see it in London. We want to take Lauren and Chapel into America. So that's the other reason for trying it out here, that um, we're hoping um, to actually take it to Vegas. Oh, that would be, be a great a, Vegas that show. That would be a great Vegas show, wouldn't it? Because circus and comedy and it yeah. appeals internationally. Amazing. Well, we're going to be showing the promo now of your lovely Peter Pan. So I want to say thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to meet you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. James. Thank you. After the break, I'll be joined by UK singer-songwriter Shinika Simon, who has a truly inspirational story and a new debut album. So let's find out more. See you in a minute. Join me, Peter Pan, when I fly to a venue near you. See the life-size pirate ship sail through the audience and watch me fly over your heads as I battle the pirates. Starring the legendary Boy George as the infamous Captain Hook. I'm gonna get you, Pan. Do you really want to hurt me? Oh yes, I do. Yeah, but do you really want to make me cry? <laughs> and direct from Hollywood, Dorit Kemsley is the mermaid. The biggest crocodile you've ever seen. <laughs> Come and see the world's biggest Christmas show. It's a cast of a hundred with a dozen flying Cirque superstars. We've got a 10,000 gallon water wall. Fire, sword fights, explosions, and giant screens, so you don't miss any of the action. <laughs> if you want the ultimate family adventure, come and see Peter Pan this Christmas. These two are a barrel of laughs. <laughs> Tickets are getting snapped up. Have you got yours? Welcome back to the show. Joining me now is Shanika Simon, whose career has seen her perform as a backing singer for the likes of Will Young, Sting and Annie Lennox, to name but a few. Her own incredible story, however, is full of personal struggles that have led to her penning an emotional debut single called Underground Railroad. The single also features legendary blues artist Eric Bibb. So let's talk to her and find out more. Hello, Shanika. Thank you so Hello. much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Um, Shanika, you've, this is your first television yes. appearance yes. so it's wonderful to have you on the show and the actual um, song itself I've listened to the video it's, it's really really powerful mm -hmm. so I'd like to if I may just go back to, to the beginning for you because mm -hmm. you witnessed domestic abuse from the age of five yes. and um, and this really kind of penned your story didn't it yes. so tell us about that well I would say in the year 2020 as many people dubbed it the year of 2020 vision. Yes. I kind of had this epiphany of um, all the holdbacks I've had, the strongholds. And I think for me, it stemmed all the way back to witnessing domestic violence. That was my father against my mother. And I think that was always uh, a daily flashback that I got. And it kind of held me. It was, a, like I said, a stronghold for me just progressing and moving forward with my hopes and my dreams in life. So um, I spoke to my producer, Glenn Scott, and um, I just told him everything. Every single <laughs> worry that Force I had, everything. Yeah. And I said, I think I'm ready to sing. I'm ready to share my story and it will help me. I'll get healing from it, but I think it would also help other people. For anybody else that's gone through similar, mm. will be able to share and maybe lighten the load. And maybe relate to it, of course, yeah, because yeah. domestic abuse is a, is a huge problem around the world. Yeah. And, and for you, Shanika, what, at what point did you start singing? Was it something you've always done? Well, um, legend has it that when I was born, I came out and <laughs> um, my face was very stern. And my mom said, oh, I think there's something wrong with the baby. And you know, back in those days, they used to spank the baby, yes. so they spanked me. And I let out a huge sound and my grandma said, oh, she's going to sing. Oh, that's So I'm just going to say that that's when that's it That's it. You can't say earlier than that, really. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and was it something you always did, even through your childhood? Do you perform at school and things like that? Yeah, I always sang in the school choirs mm -hmm. and things like that. But um, having a mother who sang and then my dad is a bassist and then my grandparents 
or reverence who also sang and then I have cousins who sing and then everybody is just musical so it was always in the house always yeah. around me and it's just innate yeah it's and something clearly you enjoy love it and is it something that you um it, now you've done this this debut single mm. and it's come from an album in fact yeah. so um tell us about that how did I mean that's a big thing to suddenly you know have this inspiration want to share did you did you write all the songs all at once or did, was this over a time or this was over I'm gonna say it maybe a month or so um going back again to year 2020 my grandmother passed away and it was almost as if when she died and took her last breath it was my turn to start breathing and to start living and to really go at it she was 89 and I thought I can't be 89 on my deathbed thinking what if why didn't I try so I took that from her it's like she passed the baton on to me and so I thought I'm gonna run with it so me and Glenn started to talk and pen um his pen game is just awesome yes so we we just went back and forth you know it was the lockdown mm -hmm. so we were emailing we were sending voice notes we were writing we were um, recording. I was recording at home, he'd record at his house or his studio and then we were just exchanging ideas. It's amazing actually, lots of singer-songwriters during that lockdown period mm. um, penned a lot of songs because it was <laughs> what else to do really. But did you, was that the time that you really focused on what you wanted to do? Yes. For a lot of the family, my grandma passing away was like, oh we're so sad, but for me, even now I feel so emotional about it. I feel like She's still with me, but she really encouraged me every single time she heard me sing. She would always say, oh, Chin, that was rich. That was her nickname for me, Aww. Chin. That was so rich. And I think I just take that with me. And what's the name of the album? Have you got a name for it? Yes, River Salvation. Okay. Yes, it talks about the different challenges that we have, um, finding self-love. Um, acceptance in ourselves but also acceptance in the world and maybe the different um, structures in society which we might see t that, um, that maybe hold us back but we've got to find the strength within ourselves in order to propel and to fly and to soar. And I'm sure yeah. your grandma would have been very proud of you, Shaniku, because you're, speak mm. you're speaking very eloquently about what you want to do. And, mm. and this this it now, you've found your path yes. and you're gonna pursue it. Yes, yes, with all my strength. <laughs> so this, now tell us about this song, Underground Railroad. Okay, so Underground Railroad is a song by me and Eric Bibb, who has accompanied me. So grateful for Eric to be on this record. Yes, how did you meet him? I met Eric through Glenn Scott, right. who is the producer, co-writer, and um, the label head. Um, he, they're friends, they've worked together over the years, so there's many albums that Eric has done, and I've been on them, just doing BVs and little guest vocal yes. here. But in terms of his last Dear America album, I was on a particular song and I did this recording a few weeks after my grandma passed. And this is when I had the conversation with Glenn. Right, yeah. And told him everything from my life story. And he had turned around and said, you're not a victim, you know? And I thought in my mind, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, you're not. And in my mind, again, I thought, yes, I am. He said, but you're not. And then he said, you can have anything you want. You just name it and you claim it. So when I did this session with Glenn for Eric, it was supposed to be for somebody else to sing. When I went home that night, I said, I really like that song. I want it for myself. I want to be debuting with um, Eric. Yeah. I want to do that duet. And as the months went, Glenn was saying to me, you know, we're still waiting from the other side if they're going to do it if they're yes it all takes time doesn't yes, it yeah it does. mm. and I was still you know having my faith thinking um no it's mine and eventually I got the call that said it was, it was mine and I said there you go and he appears on the video yes he does. so tell us about what the song is about so the song is about um traveling you know life is a journey and I think for me, myself, where I have been and where I am now and where I'm going, it's like a, a long journey. I am 
kind of doing it undercover, if you will. I'm not so much saying, hey, everybody, look at me, but I'm kind of doing it in, in the darkness of the night. I am making strides with my writing, with my um, fitness. I've lost four stone. Well done. Since 2020, there's loads of things that I've done. Just trying to find that promised land where I'm at peace, where it's home, mm. whether that's with family, there's dynamics there, marriage, that's been up and down, and I'll talk more about that yes, in the future. Yes. <laughs> but you know, just looking at for a brighter day. That and that is... comes across in the song. Yeah. Yeah, which is presumably why, how you penned it. Yes. And did you write it by yourself or was Eric involved in the writing stage as well? This, I think, was more so down to a conversation that I had with Glenn. And um, he listens very well. And I just go, do, 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 do. <laughs> and then the next day, I've got this song. Yeah. I, I wrote it with you in mind after our conversation. And it's just great because it's everything that I feel. Yeah, and yeah. very melodic. And, and the rest of the album, what's the rest of the album like? Is it, is it along the same lines or do you? Yeah, I would say it ventures out a bit. We have some soul influences here and there. Still has that kind of bluesy feel, but a bit folky as well. And poppy vibe. Is that your genre? What would you say a genre would be for you? Uh, I would say it's a soul, jazzy, bluesy, bluesy. poppy, <laughs> gospel. A little vibe. bit of everything. Yeah, yeah a little bit sort. of everything. It's all fluidic because we like to always put music into genres, mm. but it's it's having that um, creative expression, if you like, yeah. to just create your own own genre. Yeah, which it sounds like that. you're doing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what about the rest of your family? Um, are they very proud about what you're doing at the moment? Yes. And, you know, because when we had the release, I had phone calls from my son saying, Mom, you didn't tell me that you were releasing a single. <laughs> my mum was like, you didn't tell me. Oh, so you didn't tell anyone? I didn't tell anyone. Wow. Kind of kept it quiet. It's Why was that, Janika? I don't know. I think everything's very new. Yes. So I'm kind of just... Yes. Taking my strides, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Um, but they're very proud of everything they see and everything that they hear. I have loads of phone calls from um, family and friends really encouraging me because they know the past and they know what it must have taken to really stand out now. Mm. It does. It takes very courage for, you know, for what you've been through yeah. and to... It's why so many creative people make so many amazing records mm. because they take all their history, all their past, all their emotions and then put it into song. Yeah, yeah. Which is what you're doing. Yes. Which yeah. is something, you know, that you're con going to continue to do by the sounds of it. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break, but come back and join me again in just a minute. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm here with Shanika Simon. Shanika, just before the break, we were talking about this wonderful uh, new debut single you've got. But if I may, I'd like to go back a little bit further about your past and mm. really all the things that have made you for where you are today. Okay. So what happened? Okay, so where domestic violence is um, concerned, I just remember possibly being around four or five and there being some sort of an argument and everything happened very fast, but very slow at the same time. And um, within that kerfuffle, I remember calling my mom. She had locked herself in the bathroom and I called her out because my dad said he wasn't going to do anything to her. And the fact that she came out because I said, come out. And then what happened happened with the most terrible beating you could ever imagine. I think I then lived life blaming myself that I'm the one that called my mum to get beaten and be um, have broken ribs and be bleeding internally. And I carried that for so many, so many years. I can imagine. Right, until yeah. I eventually spoke to Glenn and then I was able to seek um, therapy yes. and different things and start really looking inside at the turmoil that I've been through just by witnessing that. Because it's not your fault. 
No. It's never your fault. No. But at the time, I should imagine, because you were only young, I can totally see yeah. why you, you know, why you did that. And especially because you mentioned that your father was musical, musical as well. Yes. And um, so that must have been quite difficult because there's your dad, the musician, mm. and then there's the dad that, you know, beats up your mother. Right. I mean, I still talk to him, but I think for my own mental health, there has to be this kind of line that he doesn't cross and that I don't cross. I love him to bits, but I don't respect those actions. And there's never really been any remorse that I know of. Blaming myself was because when the trauma happened, I was so young and I think I kind of froze mm. at that age. Even though I was living, my mind was still there thinking, but I need to help my mom. But I've also just called her to this fate. Do you know what yes, I mean? Yes, I can understand. So yeah. you've poured all of these emotions mm. and into your music. Yeah. And has that helped you? It has. It has. And I think it's helped me come to peace with everything. As I said, the therapy helps. But also singing is a time when I feel free. It's a joyful thing, oh, isn't it? I love yeah. it. And what do you see for the future, Shanika? Ooh. The future, ooh, it's, it's, it's... Is it scary? Is it slightly scary for you? I mean, scary might not be in a good the way. Word. Yeah, yes. in, in a good, in a good way. Because it's unknown. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I see little bits here and there. Yes. Of, ooh, I like the look of that. Yes. I'm really excited for the future. And do you see yourself singing always as a solo artist or would you perhaps like to collaborate with another artist at all? I would love to collaborate, but... Yes, it's time for Shanika Simon to sing her yes. life and to share her gift with yeah, the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to be watching your lovely video um, with your single. Um, when When's it released? What date is it actually coming out? It was released in April. Fantastic. Yeah. So it's out already. It's out Wonderful. already. Uh, has it been all that you thought it would be? Yes, it has. But um, that's good. Yeah, I'm just enjoying it, yeah. you know. I think nothing before it's time and I wasn't ready before and at one stage I did think oh you're too old you know I'm nearing on I'm going to be 39 on Thursday you're never too old yeah okay <laughs> you look but, amazing thank you so much but I just thought oh no you can't do it you can't do it but I think it's Nana's passing yes that was like no you've got life live it being in the musical world is, is a very tough industry mm. um Will you continue, do you think, to work with the likes of Eric and, you know, other people like that? And obviously Glenn has, has had a huge impact on your life. Yeah. Um, in fact, I would probably say he was pivotal in, in for what you've, what you've achieved so far, in That's so much true. that he, you li he listened to your story yeah. and from what you've told me. So that, that, you know, you must feel blessed to have that, yes. to have those people around you. Yeah, definitely would love to keep working with Eric. He's just great. He's... He's like a mentor. He doesn't know he's like a mentor, yeah. but he is. Yeah. He, and he's a legend in his own right. He Hugely is. Hugely famous, he is. yeah. And I just love to sit and watch him and listen to him. He and what about a tour? Would you consider doing a tour? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd love to. I Good. mean, I've been touring with family, so I'd love to... Um, yeah, because you've, saw, you've been back in singer for Will Young and Annie yeah. Lennox, so you must be used to life on the road. Yes, um, I do BVs for Liz Mitchell of Boney M yes. at the moment as well. Great. She's my cousin, so I enjoy Brilliant. all life. Yeah. So there is a musical connection in your, in your whole family, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we'd like to do now is introduce this amazing video that we're going to go and see. So would you like to take this opportunity to introduce it to our audience? Okay. Hey everyone, Shanika Simon here. This is my debut single, Underground Railroad, featuring Eric Bibb. Enjoy. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining me today, Shanika. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, come back and join me again next week. See you very soon. Bye-bye for now.
in a row that soothes me I walk beside all my doubts So I'm looking for signs to help me Take me where the river runs Gone and time rolls on. This underground railroad has a means. Buy myself some farmland and live a life that makes me glad. Make me glad. 